Master of Arms, Lord Foxworth. How are the realm's defenses proceeding? My lord, I am proud to report that your kingdom's defenses will not be breached by the armies of House Hackett, even now as they are led by the 11th Earl of Mera on their way to battle here. And what of the fate of Silverglade Tower? They had a vulnerability in their outer defenses. At least they had insurance. Yes, daughter. But now they are part of House Hackett. And what of the fate of Stormwatch Keep? Everyone there used the same password Welcome. to enter the main gate. And this Welcome. was found out by House Hackett's army who entered the keep as if they belonged there. And what of the fate of Winterbane Bastion? They were deceived by a gift of a magnificent giant wooden horse, which turned out to be full of Hackett soldiers and the 11th Earl of Mar himself. Uh, and what of Dragonclaw Keep? My lady, at the time, they had the best defenses in the realm. However, House Hackett has no honor and used letters of correspondence to deceive the butcher, the banker, and the candlestick maker of Dragonclaw into a trap, effectively holding the entire keep supply of meat, coin, and candles for ransom. With all of these failures in defenses, what makes you so confident that our current defenses will hold against the Earl of Mar and House Hackett? My king, after careful study of the various tools, tactics, and techniques of our adversary, I've concluded that an air gap of our palace enclave won't be breached by House Hackett's forces as they have no way to fly. Lord Foxworth, um, but what about dragons and the inconvenience of running the realm and all commerce from this elevated and lofty perch? My king and my lady, dragons, of course, are not real. Your kingdom's ability to survive depends on putting only the most critical parts of your government air born and air gapped here at Palace Enclave. It requires commitment from the crown to rule in this manner, but I assure you, doing so from the ground intertwines you with forces that are nigh impossible to ferret out. This is wise counsel, Lord Foxworth. You have done the realm a great service this day. Hi there, it's Ron Gula from Gula Tech Adventures, and this week we are going to discuss House of Enclaves, why we don't use separate enclaves as part of our InfoSec advantage when doing cybersecurity. I'd like to take a moment and thank all the subscribers. We crossed 200,000 subscribers to the Google Tech Adventures YouTube channel. I get a great deal of enjoyment sharing everything that Cindy and I have learned starting multiple companies, including Tenable Network Security, and of course, what we're doing day in and day out with Google Tech Adventures. All right, House of Enclaves. Why do a video on segmentation? It's because for the most part, living in the real world, we don't have security. When I worked at the National Security Agency, I had multiple computers on my desktop. I had one for a top secret SCI network, one for a top secret network, one for secret, one for unclass. One was for UFOs, one was for mind control. No, I'm just joking, right? But the point is, is all of those computers were basically connected to other computers of that same classification level, managed by people who had that classification level and moving data to and from those networks basically took an act of God or basically the ability to traverse highly specialized guards where only one type of data is allowed to move one way. Out here in the real world, we don't have that. We have the illusion of security, right? We have our cybersecurity, right? We have a bunch of cyber vendors. We have, we have patching vulnerabilities. We have cyber hygiene, right? And that's what we do today. But all of that is built sort of on a castle of sand or a throne of lies. I ever want to look at that, right? What are we measuring or what are we managing? We manage an operating system that we really don't control. Try not to name a whole lot of names, but pretty much if you do a security patch, you're probably going to get some features in there as well. We might be doing this with phones that we also don't really control, same operating system argument, but we can also get configurations from our carrier that can push certifications and other types of apps on their phone that we might not even know. And if you know you live in the DC area and you're around offensive people, you know, guess what? You can do a zero day on a phone and hop from a 5G network to a Wi-Fi network and maybe break a hard target that way, right? So really, really difficult. And let's talk about the SaaS apps for a second, right? A lot of major SaaS vendors have had major security issues. Even though the cloud is secure and I get the arguments about, look, you're, you're letting somebody do one thing really well and defend against it, but without the transparency to really throw throw down and seeing how are these networks really, really resistant to attack? These SaaS networks, are, are these applications that are dip resistant to attack? It's really hard to say that your email, your data in the cloud is secure, even though there's you know, encryption involved and that sort of thing, because it's just not, it's not transparent. 
So what are we supposed to do now as individuals? What can we do to kind of protect our data without being so draconian that we have to be like the NSA and have separate things? Well, basically it's a combination of culture and technology. Now, fortunately, the technology exists to allow computers to communicate with each other and nobody else. What doesn't exist though is the culture. People do not want to let go of their phones. People do not want to let go over their, the convenience of having uh, their social media on the same application or the same laptop that they're doing work, you know, VPNing into to get to the secure database, right? And that's where you have to attack. But let's just start talking about some really, really basic things. Let's imagine we have a room in a secure facility with two computers, and those two computers are connected by one Ethernet. Well, let's just say there's a router in there, but for the fake this for the for this argument, two computers, one Ethernet. You can get it done. It's doable. Uh, having said that though, what is the attack surface of this thing? Well, first of all, people who have access to the room, they could take a computer, they could overhear a conversation, they could put a listening device. Uh, that, you know, people who have access, right? Could the computers that you bought have had an implant on them? Yeah, they 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 could have, right? But how does that implant beacon out. Well, there's been some sci-fi stories where, you know, AI have broken into these secure rooms and somehow flash the infrared light on the LED as a signal out and that sort of thing. But for the most part, this is not a valid sort of attack path that that but we have to be really, really worried about. Um, it's mostly bugging the, the 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 room with an implant on the computer in there or an employment link. That's that's there. But now let's remove the room. Let's remove the Ethernet. And let's just say those two computers now are at my house and a coworker's house. And I'm going to connect those two computers with a captive VPN that I really don't care what the transport layer is or, and what the connection to the internet is. Are they going to use a, uh, a Wi-Fi access to, 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 to get out? Are they going to use Bluetooth to my phone? Are they going to use Ethernet, right? If as long as that network stack is captive and it can only communicate with that other computer over on the other side has a similar sort of captive network. I'm not talking about a zero trust network that lets people buy products on Amazon or watch Netflix or download download games. I'm talking about a truly isolated segmented network. If you have that, look, your attack surface doesn't change a whole lot. Now a secure room in a secure facility is a little bit different than my house, a little bit different than maybe a coworker's house, work from home. But most of what the close in access is, is from people who are within. It's a much more a, a, a control type surface to do that. Now, why am I kind of going through this? Well, it's because almost everything else that we do here is we talk about you know using some weird combination or a, a proprietary combination of zero trust access control and so on to get to a cloud app and on-prem and so on. Building these building blocks up pretty, pretty low to do that. Now, let's say these two computers I'm, what am I going to do with it? Well, from a culture point of view, what am I willing to put on those two computers that I can then do separately from my normal things? What do we do in, in life? We, we, we Zoom, right? We surf the internet, we download software, we, we, we interact with, with different types of ads. If I want to interact with my employees, do I want a private email? I can do that. I can put that on one of those computers. Is there a private equivalence of Slack? Yes, absolutely. I can do private chat. Can I do collaboration? Can I do uh, file sharing? Can I create and, and move things? Yes, you can do all those things. There's a combination of commercial software that does these kind of things. There's a combination of open source software that, that does these things. Now, if you have two computers doing this, can you have a server running these things and have the same level of cryptography that accesses and make sure that only those people who are working those computers have access to the things that they have? both access and author authorization to those things. You can absolutely do that. What happens though, is people just sort of start using things. Like we all just started using Zoom. We all started using Box. We all started using Office 365. And now it's sort of like the genie's out of the bottle. So doing this kind of thought experiment really sort of says what is important and what is not important. Now, another way to think about this is think about maybe all of the cybersecurity products in the world. This is really unfair. All my portfolio companies are going to hate this. But let's assume they're as effective against malware and hackers as masks in the, you know, was against basically COVID, right? Maybe not the best politically correct example, but you get where I'm going. And when you look at some of these people that got ransomware and they had like the best tech from Microsoft and the best tech from certain places, you do, the lay people outside of our industry really kind of go, what am I buying? 
But the reason is because we're trying to secure everything with a different policy for everybody and a different technology for everybody. If you think about what happens on the internet, content comes from the internet, stays on that side of the house. Well, now you can basically start segmenting your life, segmenting your office, segmenting your business. Basically saying the things I'm going to create, my innermost thoughts with my employees, I'm going to put on this segmented network. But my website, which is going to be public anyway, you know, my documents that are going to be public anyway, put them on the side of the internet where it's publicly facing. I'm not saying no security. Do your access control. Do cyber hygiene. Do all that kind of stuff. But if you're going to have a corporate board meeting, why do it on a, a cloud application when you could be doing it on something you control? I've I've done you know zooms with with a lot of other technology. I, I we, I'm saying zoom like I say Xerox when I make a copy, but the point is is that you can do video conferencing, you can do phone calls, you can do all that different kind of stuff on segmented networks. You just have to have the will and the culture to go ahead and start doing that. Now there's also blended approaches here. I've seen a lot of different organizations is look we're going to have the segmented network, but we're only going to allow a few SaaS apps. Now before your head kind of explodes, think about the SaaS apps that you might want to connect to. Maybe something like ProtonMail, which now has you know full end-to-end -end encryption of files, full end-to-end -end encryption of, 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 uh, of email and that sort of thing. Maybe that's an okay thing for you to connect to, right? The idea is you can have this blended approach of offering those things that are out there. Now, lastly, if you have your Enclave network, chances are, your enclave. One thing that one thing about the I always tell people about top secret is there's this other level of top secret with this top secret secure compartmental compartmented information. It basically says it's a subdivision of stuff that's so top secret only these people need to get to know. Well, if you're in your business, maybe your human resources people have an enclave of computers, and that enclave can talk to maybe a corporate collaboration system, a corporate communication system. And maybe your engineering people are different as well. Maybe they have a different set of computers to do these kind of things. Now, before you say, whoa, this is really hard to do, but it's really, you know, kind of uh, uh, impossible types of scalable technology. I'm telling you that this stuff is there. I think stuff you probably already bought from your existing zero trust vendors, from your existing uh, collaboration vendors, you have the ability to kind of make these things happen and separate it. And when you separate it, you get some confidence. I would struggle right now to have any company in the world where the CEO can send a company-wide update and not have somebody be able to take that text verbatim and forward it out to some other system, right? Now, of course, there's, there's always other attacks like, like uh, now they can just write it down, they can take a phone call. This comes to trusting people. But from an actual electronic connection of a system device that can send something out like a sensitive corporate letter from a CEO, we're just not there yet. We're just not there yet. All right, so we've done a couple different investments in this area. Uh, the main one that we've done, is, this is called House of Enclaves, right? But the we have a company called Enclave that does allow people to have one of these stealth layer two over, over numbers. Doesn't do everything I talked about. Doesn't do the isolation. Doesn't do this the, um, the, the, the capture of VPNs and whatnot. But if you're going to build something like this, you're going to have to do it with whoever your vendors are, whether it's a Cisco, Checkpoint, Microsoft, Palo, that, that, that sort of thing. You can do it open source. And of course, the, the cool thing about this is, you know, if you're starting a company, now is the time to really say what is separate and what is going to be my most innermost thoughts of my company and why would you want to have all that stuff on cloud apps that you don't control and whatnot. So again, this is tech and it's culture and it's all about making a decision of what is important for you to keep secret and just not playing that game of playing whack-a-mole vulnerability patching trying to hunt the malware, trying to trust that everybody is perfect on a perfect day, it's tough to do. The more you can take what's critical out of that cyber hygiene thing and make it defensible and with, with the integrity of encryption, the better off you're going to be at protecting your networks. I hope you enjoyed this. I know this is a little bit controversial and so on, but if you want to see more videos like this, give me a shout out at uh, over on LinkedIn and also give us a subscribe here on YouTube. Thanks again for watching. Have a great week.
Master of Arms, Lord Foxworth. How are the realm's defenses proceeding? My lord, I am proud to report that your kingdom's defenses will not be breached by the armies of House Hackett, even now as they are led by the 11th Earl of Merart on their way to battle here. And what of the fate of Silverglade Tower? They had a vulnerability in their outer defenses. At least they had insurance. Yes, daughter. But now they are part of House Hackett. And what of the fate of Stormwatch Keep? Everyone there used the same password to enter the main gate. And this was found out by House Hackett's army who entered the keep as if they belonged there. And what of the fate of Winterbane Bastion? They were deceived by a gift of a magnificent giant wooden horse, which turned out to be full of Hackett soldiers and the 11th Earl of Mar himself. Uh, and what of Dragonclaw Keep? My lady, at the time, they had the best defenses in the realm. However, House Hackett has no honor and used letters of correspondence to deceive the butcher, the banker, and the candlestick maker of Dragonclaw into a trap, effectively holding the entire keep supply of meat, coin, and candles for ransom. With all of these failures in defenses, what makes you so confident that our current defenses will hold against the Earl of Mar and House Hackett? My king! After careful study of the various tools, tactics, and techniques of our adversary, I've concluded that an air gap of our palace enclave won't be breached by House Hackett's forces as they have no way to fly. Lord Foxworth, um, but what about dragons and the inconvenience of running the realm and all commerce from this elevated and lofty perch? My king and my lady, dragons, of course, are not real. Your kingdom's ability to survive depends on putting only the most critical parts of your government air born and air gapped here at Palace Enclave. It requires commitment from the crown to rule in this manner, but I assure you doing so from the ground intertwines you with forces that are nigh impossible to ferret out. This is wise counsel, Lord Foxworth. You have done the realm a great service this day.